we're about halfway through this chapter. And so far we've been introducing some mathematical ideas, some conceptual ideas, and we haven't really gotten to the point of it yet. So I'm going to start by giving you the point of what we're trying to do. We're going to make a little bit of progress of actually doing this in this, uh, in this section of the chapter. And then at the end I'll come back to why did we care about this. So recognize that we're still not getting to the actual examples here, but this is kind of the key part of the whole chapter. So why? Why are we trying to do anything with Gauss's law? Which again, you haven't been told what it is yet. So sometimes this is going to be easier than Coulomb's law, especially for complicated shapes. So remember that Coulomb's law for complicated shapes, you have to break up every piece of your charge distribution into a tiny point charge, and then you integrate it all up. And while you're doing that integral, you have to keep in mind that the distance between the point you're calculating and the distribution is varying so the and perhaps the direction is varying so the electric field direction is varying so you break it into components and you're integrating different electric field vector components over different things it's kind of a nightmare so this is going to be simpler in many cases interestingly this is actually more fundamental than coulomb's law uh, perhaps you didn't notice, but we've kind of pulled Coulomb's law out of nowhere. We said, hey, we made some measurements of forces between point charges, and this is what the function looks like. Cool, we'll call it Coulomb's law. Now, that isn't coming from some deep thing that we understand. It just came from a measurement. And nothing's wrong with a measurement, but physicists really prefer things that are coming from deep fundamental theories. And while we won't really get to it in this class, there's actually a deep fundamental theory, a deep symmetry of the universe that underlays Gauss's law. So Gauss's law actually appears in something called Maxwell's equations. You've possibly heard of Maxwell's equations. Maybe you have it on a t-shirt or a coffee mug. We will get to it near the end of the class. Maxwell's equations are kind of the starting point of more advanced electricity and magnetism classes. But for us, it's kind of more where we get to. And Gauss's law is what appears in that, not Coulomb's law. So Gauss's law is always true. Coulomb's law was kind of for point charges. So finally, Gauss's law is going to facilitate some additional simplifications and some conceptual reasoning. So this is where it's a catch-22. If you understand Gauss's law, you can use it to reason through a bunch of situations without doing any math. However, it's hard to understand Gauss's law when you don't see why we care about it. So when I think about certain situations with electric fields, I'm inherently using Gauss's law to think through it. So just trust that if you get Gauss's law down, and it's a pretty complicated, challenging, abstract idea, it will help you think about many situations. So let's start by thinking about the flux from a point charge. And this is where we're going a little bit back to that tactics box to say, OK, I'm going to have a closed surface. So I'm creating a Gaussian surface, must be closed. And I want to pick something that is going to have a good symmetry. In particular, either it ha is perpendicular to the electric field everywhere or a parallel to the electric field everywhere. And so this has to do with matching your symmetries. And again, the symmetry between your electric field and your charge distribution will match. And here we have a point charge. And a point charge has a spherical symmetry. So we're going to use a spherical surface. So it's called a Gaussian sphere. And again, we're not literally taking any sort of material and putting it around a point charge. I'm just choosing a sphere to do my math on. So now I think, hey, is my field parallel or perpendicular to my surface? Now we can just look and we see that it is perpendicular. And remember that if we're talking about A, they're then parallel, which is what you want. So we then get to simplify this and notice that this is centered. So the center of my sphere is at my point charge. And so since it had a spherical symmetry, we assume that the strength of the electric field is the same everywhere. And again, we know that from Coulomb's law, but you also can guess that from the symmetry. So because E is constant in strength, and everywhere is parallel to my dA, we get to multiply. A now is the area of my sphere. So what's the final step? And again, here our goal is to find the flux. There's different ways to approach this, but that's what we're doing right now. We plug in the value for E 
and in this case we are going to use Coulomb. And notice we're using a point charge, so that's valid. And then we're also going to think about what the surface area of a sphere actually is. So we know that the surface area of a sphere is 4 pi r squared, and r represents the radius of the sphere. And this is coming from Coulomb's law. And this isn't always going to be, again, the approach we use here, but we're working towards basically deriving Gauss's law, or at least a very simple form of Gauss's law. And this first notion going from the complicated surface integral over a closed surface to just multiplication, remember that was those simplifications on the first one. So we plug them in, and again here, A is this, so that's coming here, and then E is coming down here. So I've kind of actually switched the order of E and A, but I bet you can handle that. So now we simplify a little bit. And look, there's a 4 pi here and a 4 pi there, so that cancels. There's an R squared here on top coming from the area and an R squared there on the bottom coming from Coulomb's law. So wow, that actually simplifies down a lot. Now, one thing that I'll say here is that if you have met Gauss's law before, this isn't fully Gauss's law. We've done something that looks a whole lot like Gauss's law, but this is still not quite there. So this is for one single point charge. But notice that this doesn't actually depend on the radius we plugged in. We say that the flux we get is Q, the point charge, the amount of point charge at the center, over epsilon naught, which is the constant that keeps coming up in our equations. Notice also that if Q is negative, you have a negative flux. If Q is positive, as we've kind of drawn here, then you would have a positive flux.